Okay, so this is a screen on weighted average cost of capital that I created. I will try to attach it at the bottom of this YouTube. But basically, we've been talking about weighted average cost of capital. And first of all, you'd have to find the price earnings ratio for the Dow, which is about 15 and a half, given all this craziness. You could find that on the Wall Street Journal website. Just search into markets or search for price earnings ratio. They don't change that dramatically unless you have a market like this. I would use around 15 and a half and today's date is 423, 2020. But um, basically the PE for the Dow or the PE for the S&P 500 would give you a general idea of where the market is yielding. So what you do is that means investors are paying 15 and a half dollars for every dollar of earnings. So if you place one over 15 and a half, you're getting about a 6.45% yield, right? If I'm paying $15.5 for a dollar of earnings, I'm getting a six and almost a six and a half percent yield. Okay, then we'd have to look at the company's average tax rate. So I'm gonna use 30% here, which is about average for a big corporation. So what we're really saying is a corporation is gonna pay about 30% of its earnings. And the reason why that's important is because interest payments are tax deductible. So if interest payments are, payments are tax deductible, we have to account for that in our cost of how we source capital. So afterwards, we're going to look at a, a debt to equity ratio. Here, I'm going to use 50% for debt, and I'm going to use about 50% for equity. Generally speaking, I'm probably being a little more aggressive, and that's a tape for a different day, but it's probably more like 30% debt, 70% uh, equity. I'm going to use a 50-50 split. But, you know, always remember, debt is tax deductible, so companies would be more encouraged to uh, use debt. However, debt carries a lot of problems, right? That debt carries issues. It's like over-mortgaging your house. Yes, you get more tax benefits, but on the other hand, you've got to deal with a much higher payment, and that has psychological effects, maybe, maybe makes you make different, you won't take chances, or you wouldn't um, invest in things because then you have these high debt payments. That's the Medigliani Miller theorem. But uh, long story short is even though debt is tax advantaged, and remember debt, you're not taking on partners, you, you could leverage your income. We could see in a down market that could be very hard, you know, because leverage cuts both ways. So money we make on the upside could really hurt us on the downside. On the other hand, if debt is used in an intelligent way and you can leverage your investment, you could do much better, right? If I have $1,000 to invest in a stock and it goes up 10%, I made a 10% return. If I take that $1,000 and I leverage it two for one, which is the margin requirements, well, then I would make almost 20% after I take out my interest cost because I bought twice as much stock. But remember, on the way down, you lose twice as fast. So that's, a, again, a video for another day, but leverage cuts both ways. And we're seeing that a lot of real estate investors and people who invested in oil or in the markets are getting hurt, hit, hit hard now because they do a lot of leverage. All right, the yield on the 10-year debt, I'm going to use about 2% now because that's what the yield is. Well, actually, the yield is like unheard of levels. It's like a half a percent, but I'm going to use 2% for more normalized times. But the 10-year bond, the 10-year government bond is the safest and what we consider the risk-free rate. It's the risk-free rate on all bonds. So the 10-year bond trades at about half a percent now because of these unusual times, but for a long time it's trading at about 2%. And that means the government is sourcing capital at 2%, and they're the safest investor given our military power, our constitution, our system of jurisprudence, and the fact that uh, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. All of these things add up to create the most safe investment on an inflation adjusted basis. So people from all over the world feel that if they put their money in the US dollar and they, if you've ever traveled, you would understand that dollars are accepted just about anywhere, that the yield on the 10 year debt is going to be the safest yield. So that's our risk-free rate. And we're gonna employ, employ the capital asset pricing model here, which I've gone over in other videos. So if you, um, need to understand that, go back and watch the capital asset pricing model uh, video, and that would help you understand this. So the beta, and that I have three videos in either the statistic, uh, statistics academy or in the finance academy, we know that the beta is the regression between the company stock and the general market. I've done, regret, I've done three videos on that. It's regression, it's a bit of um, uh, more sophisticated statistical analysis, 
but I urge you to go back and read and watch those. Now, you can get a company's beta on Yahoo Finance. It's available to you. You go on Yahoo Finance and you look at the page, you look up the first page, and it's in the statistics that are right there in the front with market rate of return and um, uh, capital, uh, the, the, the value of the company, the dividend, you'll also see the company's beta, which is how your company is moving versus another company. Now here I use the 1.36 beta, which means that this particular company, when the stock is markets up 1%, we would expect this company to be up 1.36%. And when the market's down 1%, we would expect this company to be down 1.36%. So the risk-free rate is going to be, okay, the risk-free rate is going to be 2%. And I'm sorry, um, I'm going to make a little bit of a correction here. The yield, on, so the risk-free rate is what I described before as the government rate. The yield on 10-year debt for this particular company, we're going to say it's 10%. So I'm going to put the 10% there. And this is the risk-free rate. I'm sorry, so I kind of confused that for a minute. This is the yield on the company's 10-year debt. And this is the risk-free rate. This would be the government borrowing rate. So the government borrows at 2%. Your company is borrowing at 10%. So when we put that into the capital asset pricing model, which is the risk-free rate plus the beta multiplied by the um, PE for the Dow, or the yield for the Dow, minus the risk-free rate, you're going to come out with a cost of equity of about 8.774%. You could do the math on your own. You could use this calculator. However, remember that once again, the capital asset price model is a function of the risk-free rate, E7, plus the beta, how the market moves, multiplied by the yield on the market, right? Minus the risk-free rate. Okay, so B5 would be the yield on the market. E6 would be the beta. And minus E7, we would take out the risk-free rate, which is 2%. So we know that we will we know that in our particular situation, this is going to be 50% of our cost of capital because we've raised 50% from shareholders. The other 50% we took debt on. So how do we calculate the debt? We take the cost of our 10-year debt, 10%, which is E5, times the reciprocal of the tax rate. Because remember, when you deduct interest, you're getting to deduct that from your earnings. So you're not going to pay taxes. You're going to reduce your earnings by the amount of debt you take on. So if you're paying 30% taxes, Effectively, your debt is shielding 30% of your income. So your true cost at that point becomes 70% of the debt cost. So that's why I would use, or we do use, the cost of your debt, 10%, times 1 minus 30%, or 10,000 times 7%, which would be 10% times 7 times 70%, which is 7%. Because I know my ratios are 50-50, I come out with a weighted average cost of capital of 7.887%. Notice most companies I said use about a 70% equity ratio. If I raise that to 70 and I lower that to 30, and I should probably have a control so this can't be this can never be more than 100%. Well, notice my weighted average cost of capital goes up because I'm using more expensive equity financing and not getting the benefit of the tax shield, although I'm not carrying as much debt. And we all know, even when we buy a house, we like to have enough equity in the house where the debt doesn't overwhelm us. So think of it the same way. If my company is more risky and I have a beta of two, obviously my costs go up dramatically. Of course, my company is more risky. But if my beta is a company like Coca-Cola, which has like a beta of 0.5, uh, okay, hold on, that does not right. Let's say 0.5. Notice how my weighted average cost of capital goes down because the market is not going to demand as much of a required rate of return given the fact that I have a less risky stock than the market. And you could play with this all day long. Now the, the, the uh, wait a minute, that's wrong.
That should be 2%. I'm sorry. Uh, that's the right number. Now notice that the risk-free rate is down to 0.5%. Uh, oh, 0.5. That's where I'm making a mistake. 0.05%. Uh, 0.05%. So we're getting a bit of a break on this. And there you go. So you could continue to adjust all of these. If the P on the Dow went up, where we, if the P on the Dow went up to 20, where it was almost that for a while, well then notice the yield is lower and the required return is lower. If the yields keep coming down, say to 11, well then the markets are demanding higher because they're not paying as much, right? If the market is only paying 11, then the yield on the average stock is now 9%. Right now the markets are paying around 16. So you start to see these different relationships, which I will do other videos, but it gives you a good idea for how to not just look at weighted average cost of capital, but to look at the cost of taxes and PEs, okay? Um,